Their microphone should yeah. Um, Mr. Mayor, your microphone. Okay. Council now, Quintero. curb your enthusiasm, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us. I'd like to call to order the Glendale City Council meeting for September 14th, 2010. May we have the roll call, please? Council members Draymond? Here. Friedman? Quintero? Here. Weaver? Here. Mayor Najarian? Here. Uh, Council member Draymond, would you lead us in the flag salute, please? I will be happy to. If you'd all please rise. Step. Place your right hand over your heart and join us in saluting our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for this evening's invocation delivered by Reverend Rich Garner, pastor of the First United Methodist Church of Glendale. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we bid farewell to summer and turn to the delights of autumn, we continue to be people of wonder. The changes all around us draw us into new experiences, new opportunities. As people who have been equipped with wonder and question and concern, let us use these gifts of the mind and heart and soul to strengthen the family, the neighborhood, the community, the nation, the world in which we live. Let us wonder what needs might be met with the talents and skills with which we have been blessed. Let us question how each and all might live more safely, more productively, more fully, and wonder how we could assist in attaining such lives. Let us concern ourselves with matters of justice and reconciliation, of compassion and peace, and question which of our choices need to be transformed to better reflect our encouragement for persons to whom these human expectations are being denied. Let us resolve to serve so that all might participate in this wonder, this blessing. As leaves turn, as weather promises cooling, and act as activities change, we give thanks for the challenges we face and for the way by which you equip us to courageously embrace every wonder, every question, every concern. Amen. Amen. May we have your report, please? <coughs> the agenda for the September 14, 2010 regular meeting of the Glendale City Council was posted on Thursday, September 9, 2010 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. Thank you. May we have the next item? Presentation and appointments at number 3 and 3A is agenda preview for the meetings of September 21, 2010. Mr. Taktalian. Good evening, Mayor and Nigeria, and members of the City Council. Uh, next week's meetings start with the Glendale Housing Authority. There is one item on the agenda. It's the Director of Community Re Redevelopment and Housing regarding the Professional Services Agreement Amendment and Contract Change Order. There is no uh, business on the Redevelopment Agency agenda. There will be a joint City Council uh, Glendale Housing Authority meeting. There is one item on that agenda. It's Director of Community Services and Parks regarding the 2009-2010 Winter Shelter Program year-end report and 2010-11 Winter Shelter Program Status Report. In the afternoon, there will also be a special meeting, um, and that will be to discuss Public Works trans Transit Funds and Transit Services. And finally, moving on to Glendale City Council agenda, there are a number of consent items. At 5B is a Director of Public Works regarding Glen Oaks Boulevard traffic signal upgrades. At 5C is a General Manager of Glendale Water and Power regarding the Diedrich Reservoir Backup Pipeline Project. There are no action items, uh, and at 9A, under hearings, as Director of Community Planning regarding an appeal of Design Review Board case number 1PDR2009-052-A, located at 1550 Elmira Duro Avenue. Thank you. Mr. Kusaka, next item, please. Next item at 3B is proclamation designating September 16, 2010, as Doctor's House Day in Glendale. Mr. Draymond, would you help me with the proclamation? Please? I certainly will, Mr. Mayor. Would you like to? You want me to read it? Yes. Oh, I thought you just wanted to know. Oh. <laughs> sorry. All right, then I will. It reads as follows. I'm sorry, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't rehearse this. We didn't clear this. that up yes. a few minutes ago. <laughs> I apologize. Your proclamation reads as follows. <laughs> Whereas the doctor's house is of great value as a part of the heritage of Glendale symbolizing the city's early growth and development, and whereas the location of the doctor's house to Brand Park, 
on September 16, 1980, allowed it to be restored and opened as a museum, tangibly demonstrating the community's deep interest in preserving its heritage, and whereas the doctor's house is one of Glendale's few remaining Victorian-era buildings and as such represents a rare survivor of that style, and whereas the relocation of the doctor's house and its subsequent restoration and operation as a historic house museum could not have happened without the dedicated effort of community volunteers whose commitment over three decades has not only protected the building but also made it one of the city's most beautiful and unique educational venues, and whereas the City of Glendale, its Community Services and Parks Department, and the Glendale Historical Society have worked in partnership for 30 years to ensure that the doctor's house can be experienced by Glendale residents and visitors for generations to come. And now, therefore, our Mayor, our Najarian, City of Glendale, proclaims September 16, 2010, as Doctor's House Day in Glendale, in honor of the 30th anniversary of the relocation of the Doctor's House, which has allowed it to remain a symbol of the city's heritage and a valued community resource to be enjoyed by all. And it's signed by Mayor Ara Najarian. And I believe uh, uh, we have... Uh, Accepting this proclamation, our members of the Historical Society, Marcia Hanford, Peter Roosh, also Carol Doherty, Marie and Glenn Luft, and anyone else that would like to come forward, Margaret, Margaret Hammond, uh, Jolene Taylor, the list goes on. Too many to, to name. Please come forward. We're forward. You couldn't be much more forward. We are very forward. I do. I do. And, uh, who will accept the proclamation? Peter? I will accept it. All right, Peter, on behalf of the mayor of the city, we're very happy to present you this proclamation, uh, and it is Doctor's House Day in Glendale. Congratulations. Thank you and Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Roosh, and I'd also like to introduce Marsha Hanford, uh, who is also on the board, and uh, Margaret Hammond, who is one of the original board members of the Glendale Historical Society. Uh, I don't pretend to represent this auspicious group because it's a wonderful bunch of people, but I do have a little bit of a story to tell. Uh, in 1890, when the doctor's house, this beautiful Queen Anne Victorian, was built on 3rd and... and uh, Belmont. Belmont. Third in Belmont, uh, and third is now Wilson. There were 13 families in the Glendale Valley. The first doctor moved into the house in 1894, and the last doctor of the four doctors that lived there moved out of the house in 1914. And in that 20 years, the population of Glendale was then 3,000 people. And I don't think Dave Weaver was on the board then, but, um, <laughs> but I'm sure he was thinking about it. He just um, graduated from And in school. a sense, uh, the, the doctor's house story is the story of Glendale, because each of these doctors, as well as being a doctor in his own right, had a very important part in the development of Glendale. Uh, the first uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, was founded by one of the doctors. Uh, the first uh, educational board in Glendale was founded by another. They were all leaders in their churches, all of which are very strong here in Glendale. But the Doctor's House is also, in a sense, the story of the Glendale Historical Society of which we are very proud because the Glendale Historical Society has always represented preservation advocacy and the power of volunteerism. In that sense, uh, 65 years after the last doctor moved out of that house, this house was destined for the wrecking ball. A developer wanted to put an apartment building in on that corner, and it's there now. But he wanted to tear down the doctor's house. It was one of two remaining Queen Anne Victorians in Glendale. And there was one person that, I'm sure there were many, but one person that spoke out about this injustice, and that was Carol Doherty. And Carol Doherty managed to talk Marie Luft, and both of those people are behind me tonight, managed to talk Marie Luft into getting together and figuring out with the city council how we could save this house. So the house was sold by the developer for $1.00. 
to the city on the grounds that it could be moved by a certain date so that he could be begin construction of the apartment building. Well, little did these ladies know what it was going to take. There was, there was money available, but it turned out to be a much more expensive project than anybody ever thought it would be. So they had to learn how to write a, a, a grant block grants. They had to learn how to have yard sales, how to raise money and have home tours to raise the amounts of money needed to move this house. It took a year and the house was finally moved in the middle of the night silently on two trolleys. The house was split in half and the only sounds you heard in the streets were the sounds of whistles and clickers because they didn't want to disturb the residents of Glendale as this was moving silently from 3rd and Belmont uh, up to Brand Park. And then that's when the story really begins because they, the Glendale Historical Society was originally founded as a nonprofit organization and still is to raise money to move that house. But then they didn't realize how much was going to have to be raised to go into the reconstruction of the house. For when they got the house on the site at Brand Park uh, and pulled the girders out from underneath it, it sagged in the middle and the chimney toppled and, and they decided that they really had a project on their hands. So uh, Marie's uh, husband and uh, oh, there were about five people that originally volunteered and got together to decide what to do with this house. Over a period of time, there were up to 50 volunteers that got together every single Saturday, and of which there were a core of about 30 people that would show up every Saturday. And these people were volunteers just like you and me. Many of them were artisans and craftsmen. There were plumbers, there were contractors, uh, there were woodworkers that all put their blood and sweat and their money and their time into the four-year project of of uh, putting this house back together. And today you'll see up at Brand Park the, the fruits of their work. Uh, I'm very proud to say that we will be dedicating a kiosk outside the park because many, many thousands of people every month walk by that house and don't know what's in it or what's, you know, what it's about because it's closed most of the time. It's just open for two hours on Sundays. So we have a kiosk that's going to tell this whole story so that hopefully the hikers, the bikers, and the walkers that go by there every day will want to come into the house and see the treasure of artifacts that are in the house. We're also going to be dedicating uh, permanent displays in the downstairs bedroom that will tell this whole story of the reconstruction. Now, for the benefit of you council members and for all of our benefit, we have Marie Luft here tonight who put this book together that is called A Labor of Love, The Doctor's House, and tells the story much more succinctly that I told it to you and much more interestingly about what went into uh, remodeling this house. And uh, I would like to encourage, this will be for sale through the uh, Glendale Historical Society, but tonight we're distributing five copies, uh, one for each of the council members. Um, it it's, uh, will cost approximately $10 for those that want to buy these booklets, and it all helps the Glendale Historical Society. Um, we uh, also, uh, in addition to uh, the uh, the book and the permanent display. We're going to have a new display of Nell Shipman, who was an actress that lived in the house, a silent screen actress between 1917 and 1920. That will also be in the house. So we encourage everybody to come up and see what's inside. And I would like everybody to please give a hand to all of the people behind me that have made this all possible. And I would like to ask uh, Marie Luft if she would come up and just say a few words, please. On, or as many as you would like, because she's come a long way to be here for our big celebrations that we're having this weekend. And she's the one that's made this all possible. Thank you. This is a tremendous honor, everyone. Uh, I, my heart is very full. I, I just want to say, I, Please read it and enjoy it. Um, everything I really had to say is in the booklet. Uh, but I, I do want to tell you or say to you that in looking backward, you're also looking forward. And that's a wonderful, wonderful tribute to all of us and to all of us who have 
worked on the house and who have continued to maintain it uh, over the last 30 years. So thank you again. And, and one final thing, I'd like to thank the Parks Department because they're working their hearts out even as we speak. Uh, working on the grounds. They do a wonderful job every day of the week, but they're going to make this event very, very special. And for those that do get a chance to come into the doctor's house and see our permanent exhibit, we're going to have some of the old scrapbooks open. And I'm sure um, this would be a great incentive for me. There's a wonderful picture of Margaret Hammond 30 years ago wearing a hat and wearing a mini skirt <coughs> on the front porch of the doctor's house having some sort of liquid imbibement. It's well worth Worth seeing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret, right there? No. Hasn't changed much. Mr. Kasakin, the next item, please. Next item is City Council and staff comments. Okay, Council first. Mr. Weaver, Mr. Drango. Mr. Quintero. I have a number of things to talk about. Um, starting with Project Achieve, we had a very, very successful fundraiser, mostly in attendance, and um, had a feeling they raised quite a bit of money. The uh, David Ho Foundation continues to give incredible amounts of money to uh, the homeless here in the, uh, in the city of Glendale, so I want to thank Nick Lamb, the president of uh, Pacific BMW, and the whole family for all that they do for the uh, city of Glendale. Um, then uh, I had the opportunity to address the LA um, Veteran, LA County Veterans Commission, and um, I was actually stepping in for Peter Zovac, who was unable to. Uh, to attend, so we had a great exchange. I explained some of the veteran housing uh, proposals that we're uh, working on in the city of Glendale. They were very excited about it, and um, as they mentioned, they didn't think we were going to have any problems filling uh, some of our housing units with, uh, with veterans, both young veterans or younger veterans returning from the Gulf Wars and Afghanistan, um, or uh, elderly veterans and the woman who is the chair of the commission actually pointed out that they're beginning to to understand that there are some homeless vets uh, here in in the Los An homeless vets meaning from the Gulf Wars here in uh, Los Angeles County and she even mentioned uh, women being among them uh, then there were two other events that were very inspirational the Catholicos came from Echmiazin, Armenia, to bless the Armenian Society of Los Angeles. New building, just a really beautiful building here in Glendale. That was quite an uplifting event. And then the uh, consecration of St. Leon's Cathedral in Burbank, a beautiful uh, cathedral that uh, it's really worth visiting just to see the inside. It looks great as you drive by it, but the inside of the church is just spectacular. So that's it. Busy weekend. Ms. Friedman. Yes, it was a very, very busy weekend. I wasn't able to even get to all of the events I wanted. There was so much going on around town. Uh, but just a few of the events that I attended, which were most notable. I also attended the consecration of the cathedral, which was incredible. And I felt so welcomed there and such a sense of love and awe from all of the people in attendance. I think they had over a 1,000 people there. It was really an incredible experience. Um, also, Neighborhood Legal Services had a fundraiser, which I attended. There were, again, about a 1,000 people there and um, that was very interesting. They gave awards to some of the community members who have done a lot for social justice all around Los Angeles so that was a great event. Um, I also attended uh, parties hosted by two of our homeowners associations, Montecito Park and Royal Canyon. So I wanted to thank them for inviting council and for allowing us to uh, crash their parties. Um, and then last, on a totally different note, um, and this is more of a message to staff, I've been um, receiving a lot of emails from the neighbors around the new Disney building that 
The conversations with Disney have not been going all that well as far as they're concerned, and they're still experiencing problems. And what's of most concern to me was a, one report that there was construction going on at 11.30 at night over the weekend, or at least noise emanating from the site. So I don't know whether we have to do some sort of spot inspections on the hours they're not supposed to be you know, making loud noises or what needs to be done, but I would really like to see, I don't know how far the city can go given that it's you know, one property owner and another property owner, but whatever we need to do to make sure that at least our ordinances are being, you know, are being, um, um, you know, uh, maintained and, and kept to and whatever re relief we can do. I think we need to, to be a little bit more aggressive at this point and, and step in. Thank you. Thank you. I have a few comments. Uh, last Wednesday, we did the official dedication of the Fairmont Bridge flyover. And I know that uh, speaking of uh, residents disturbed by construction, uh, the folks in uh, Pelanconi Park, many of them their homeowners, uh, directors, and officers were in attendance, and they were very happy that uh, that bridge is finally completed. And I think it's open. Is it open yet? Not yet? Mr. Mayor, hopefully by next week we're having some problems with some of the materials and getting the, that delivered to okay. us. But so final touches are being placed Correct. on it, and it uh, should be uh, open soon. Uh, we did have a visit by... Uh, Karakin II, the Catholicos of the uh, Armenian Orthodox Church, and that's very similar to the Pope uh, of the Catholic Church. Uh, he came in and just spent a brief time in Glendale, but when he was here, he uh, not only blessed the, uh, the Armenian Center, but he extended his blessings to all of the residents of Glendale, uh, wishing upon us uh, peace and happiness. Um, Especially during the city council meetings, I told him that we sometimes get rough up here. So he extended his, his wishes of uh, peace to all of us as we work our way through the issues facing the city of Glendale. Uh, the Path Achieve event was a very nice event at the Americana. Uh, many awards were given out, and uh, the, uh, the city council uh, did receive an award for our efforts and support of the Path Achieve uh, Homeless Center. I did have a chance to attend the Montecito Park Homeowners Association, which is my home home turf, if you will. And thank you to Councilmember Friedman for telling them it was my birthday on that evening. And so I got a rousing, uh, I'm not sure how rousing it was, but it was a spirited, <laughs> a spirited uh, verse of happy birthday. Uh, thank you very much for that. The Relay for Life is coming again this year, October 2nd, at Shoal Canyon uh, Park and baseball fields. It will be a 24-hour event uh, starting approximately 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. This is a chance where all of the community gets together to support the American Cancer Society and their uh, search and um, research for a cure to cancer. It is a 24-hour event, as I said. That means you get to camp out on the ballpark. Uh, and it's really quite nice out there uh, when the sun goes down and the, the owls come out and uh, kids are out running around and playing. There's entertainment for the entire 24 hours. There's food provided. Uh, our firefighters are there. Our police officers are there. Uh, it's a very safe environment for you to come and spend some time with the family and at the same time to uh, do your part to help find a cure for cancer. And I'm going to, we're three weeks away from it, so I'm going to be reminding uh, everyone in the community each week as we get closer. Uh, the idea is to uh, be a sponsor and to make a donation to the uh, Relay for Life. You can join teams. Uh, oh, and I, I guess the relay part of it is that there's a continual uh, walking around the track. Uh, at dusk, there's a luminaria uh, celebration to honor those uh, who have survived and who also have passed uh, from cancer. A very touching event, one of the greatest events that we uh, sponsor and co-sponsor in Glendale. Um, and to that event, uh, supporting the Glendale Relay for Life is Glendale Adventist Medical Center. Glendale Adventist Medical Center has a little program uh, called the Army of Pink. Yes. 
Um, let me give you a little bit of background. There are f uh, five individuals from the city uh, community, not from the, the city government itself, but from the community who are uh, candidates, if you will. Uh, they are uh, myself, uh, Chief De Pompa, Chief Scoggins, Tony Tartaglia, uh, is it Gregory Zarian? Gregory Zarian and, do and um, Dr. Um, Bagdasarian. Dr. Bagdasarian from the Medical uh, Society. And uh, each of us has a short video on the Glendale Adventist website, and we're called the Army of Pink. The idea is that you would look at these videos, and each of us is urging uh, the viewers to vote for, vote for us uh, individually, and every vote that's cast will be translated into a $1 donation to the, Glendale, to the Relay of Life. Now, uh, organizing and spokesperson for this event and uh, spearheading it, uh, for this first year is council member Laura Friedman and as we get closer um, to that date uh, is there a particular cutoff date when they uh... I'm sure there is I don't know what it is but it's on their website and it's a really easy way that people can you know help make a difference in the community and it doesn't cost anything that's the great thing you can go in vote as many times as you want for as many people as you want as long as you vote for the mayor right as one of your votes. Um, no, you don't have to do that. You can vote for whoever you want, and for every vote that's cast, Glendale Adventist Medical Center will donate a dollar to the Relay for Life, up to $10,000. And if people want and they want to donate extra money, that money goes directly to the free cancer uh, fitness programs and other cancer support services at Glendale Adventist, like their fitness programs, the new dance class, yoga class, and their support groups. So you have two ways that you can participate, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And on that website, uh, there are uh, links to different services that Glendale Adventist provides uh, for cancer uh, patients uh, and their, their families as well. So it's a little bit fun. It's a little bit cornball, and we <laughs> do a little bit of acting and posturing in those videos. Uh, and it, it's, it'll be a, a kick just to look at it anyway. Um, and that's all I have. I do have some staff requests for comments. Officer Zakarian. Good evening, Mary, Mayor Najarian, council members, and city staff. I'm talking on behalf of the Glendale Police Department and Area Command regarding town hall meetings. You're going to be hearing about these town hall meetings throughout uh, the next few months. And I wanted to let you know that uh, the town hall meetings will be based on different uh, subjects in different parts of the city based on their needs. Uh, I wanted to present to uh, the public uh, and an invitation to, to all about the town hall meeting that's going to be hosted by our North Area Command, Lieutenant Grimes, where we're going to have uh, a few speakers, and I'll get to those. It's going to be tomorrow night, September 15th at 6 p.m. at Verdugo Hills Hospital in the uh, fourth floor council room. Chief Ron DePompa is going to be talking about marijuana and its impacts upon our community. Sergeant Tom Lorenz is going to be presenting pain medications that are found and readily available in every household. Uh, Officer Joe Allen will be talking about the current drugs and the way they are used. And then Howard Hakes from the Crescenta Valley Drug and Alcohol Prevention Coalition will be presenting uh, a, a quick summary of what the coalition's been up to, including the grant that they just received. So we wish all the public to come. Thank you. Thank you, Officer. Colin Bogart. Mayor Najarian, council members, city staff, good evening. My name is Colin Bogart. I work for the LA County Bicycle Coalition on the Safe and Healthy Streets Project. And I'm here tonight to uh, repeat an announcement I made a couple of weeks ago, and I have a slide to show to you as well as the viewers at home. Uh, about one week from now, on September 22nd and on September 25th, we'll be conducting the second annual uh, Glendale Bicyclist and Pedestrian Count, where we are seeking volunteers to help us conduct this count. Uh, we're doing the same locations and the same days of the week, same time of day as last year. Um, and we have a lot of volunteers already for this event, but I can tell you we still really need some more help. We need about 40 more people. Uh, we have roughly 26 different locations citywide. 
uh, with a, a host of different time shifts. Um, each shift is two hours long. We ask volunteers to show up at a particular location of their choosing and count all the bicyclists and pedestrians that go by. The idea is that we're building a database of information to track biking and walking trends in Glendale over the coming years. Um, give us a chance to compare uh, our count results from last year, and we also intend to share the information gathered this year with the bikeway master plan update uh, that uh, we understand is coming up soon. Uh, so once again, uh, we really need some help. We need at least about 40 more people. Uh, if people can volunteer, they can go to the uh, website for the Safe and Healthy Streets project. That's la-bike.org slash Glendale. Or uh, they can contact me directly, 818-334-9731, or call in at la-bike.org. Uh, people who go to the website can just click on a button that we have on the website. We're organizing all the volunteers through a website called volunteerspot.com, and they just click on the button, and uh, it'll give them instructions and show them a calendar where they can pick the day and time uh, that they'd like to help out. But we, uh, we could really use some help. We're, we're just about one week away. Thank you very much. Now, this is a very important project that's going to show us how we're doing in terms of um, getting people out of their cars and on their feet and on and bicycles and everything else. And I did it last year. It was a lot of fun. And you didn't mention it, and I probably shouldn't tell people, but there are wonderful gifts for all of the participants. So there don't are. do it for the gifts, but I'll tell you, the gifts were really nice, donated by our downtown merchants, if I'm correct. Yeah, actually, I'm glad you reminded me of that. We, we do have uh, thank you gifts already donated from uh, the Alex Theater and Massage Envy. Um, and then one other thing that we're doing, and I don't have, a, I don't have any to show right now, but we are also going to be giving T-shirts to all of the volunteers this year. Okay. which we had, we're having printed up specially for the count. Very good. So log on and sign up or call Colin. And Thank you very volunteer. much. Thank you very much. Did anyone else have anything that struck them or they forgot to discuss? Staff or council? Okay. Let's move on to the next item. Mr. Mayor and Council, next item consent items including minutes following a routine and may be acted upon by one motion. A member of council or the audience requesting separate consideration may do so by making such request before motion is proposed. Mr. Weaver. Mayor, I move the consent calendar at five. For a second. Second. Roll call, please. Council members, Draymond? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Montero? Yes. Weaver? Aye. Mayor Najarian? Yes. Thank you. Next item. Next item at six would be oral communications. And this is our three-minute portion of oral communications for announcements of interest uh, to the city. Leon Mayer, followed by Michael Pinto. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor to Chair, members of the council and staff. My name is Leon Mayer. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks for the memory. That'll be on the 22nd of September, 7 o'clock at the library. Bob Hope is coming back, almost coming back, in the uh, person of uh, Bob Mills, a famous uh, gag writer for Bob Hope for 17 years. Do we have it on the screen? Yes, we do. Uh, Bob Mills has written a book called The Laugh Makers, a personal tribute to Bob Hope's incredible gag writers. And this is a great event. And we invite everybody to come to the library, 7 o'clock, next Wednesday. And uh, we hope uh, you'll come and have a great time. Bob Mills worked for uh, Bob Hope for 17 years. He traveled all over the world with him. He was in on all these television and radio broadcasts. And it'll just be like having Bob Hope back here again. Bob Hope was here in Glendale in 1946. And anybody who comes to the event can get a Bob Hope library card. Uh, he was also here in 1980 for the reopening of the Alex Theater. Now, a special treat for the children. Saturday, September 18th at 2 o'clock, Bob Boyle, the Emmy Award winning creator of the Nick Jr. series, Wow Wow Wasby. And he's written a new book called Hugo and the Really, Really, Really Long String. It's going to be at the children's room. It'll, he's going to be there in person. He's going to 
do some drawings and it'll be great for you to come there. Now I do have our fall calendar and I'm going to pass it around. Uh, and I'm not going to take your time tonight to go through the uh, fall calendar, but we have a great fall, fall calendar. We'll talk to you about it more as, as the weeks uh, get closer. Uh, if, any questions about any of these events? I will, as I leave, make available things to the audience. All they have to do is raise their hand. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Michael Pinto. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, and city staff. Um, my name is Michael Pinto from Osborne Architects, uh, architect here in town. Um, I wanted to let you know that we have an event uh, this Friday with, that we're a part of that is a, an event bigger than our office, but it's Parking Day Los Angeles. And it's uh, an event that's uh, intended to help show the, uh, the space in which parking takes up in our cities. Um, I just got back from a conference in London where they built a million square foot office project with zero parking spaces. London and Glendale are different cities. Uh, we are much more dependent on the car. Um, and things don't change overnight, but it's, it's important sometimes to see how much space parking takes up. So on Friday, we will be at the corner of uh, uh, Brand and Broadway uh, using two parking spaces for an alternate use. We'll be serving shaved ice, uh, Texas style. Um, we will have plants, uh, fruit, some ice, um, and it's all coming together back at the office right now. So we invite you and uh, members of the community to come down. Um, and a second event, uh, not to com uh, compete with our second or last speaker, uh, September 22nd at 7 p.m. in our office, we have a um, an event with the Emerging Urban Design Committee uh, of the Los Angeles AIA um, that's focused on uh, the food system and uh, urban infrastructure related to the food system and how it's working. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in our office about. Um, how the food system is not serving the urban poor in uh, Los Angeles County. And um, it's a problem uh, here in Los Angeles, it's a problem in other cities, and it's something that uh, I think could be something that Glendale residents would be interested in as well. So it will be a uh, discussion, a small charrette or working session to look at these issues. And then afterwards, uh, the Bob Hope event could join us. We're going to the Granville Cafe uh, for drinks afterwards. Thank you. Can you give the date, time, and address again for that second event? Sure. It's September 22nd, next Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m. in our office, Osborne Architects at 320 East Harvard. Um, space is going to be limited at AIALosAngeles.org. Uh, you will be able to sign up for the event, uh, or you could call our office. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have no other cards for this portion of oral communications. We will move on to the next item, please. Next item, Mr. Mayor and Council, at 7A under adoption of ordinances is ordinance providing for salary supplement and continuation of certain benefits for city employees who are members of the National Guard or Armed Forces Reserves and are called uh, to active duty. This was offered on September 7, 2010 by Council Member Weaver. Mr. Mayor, I'll move 7A. Second. Second. Other discussion? If not, roll call, please. Council Members Draymond? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Weaver? Aye. Aaron Najarian? Yes. Next item, please. Your action items at 8A is City Manager regarding request from Glendale Chamber of Commerce to place a community time capsule at the City Hall Campus Plaza. At 8A1 is a resolution approving and authorizing the placement of a community time capsule at the City Hall Campus Plaza. Thank you. Ms. Beers. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, I will go to Christine Babumian um, from our office who completed the report for us. But in a quick nutshell, we had a request from the Glendale Chamber of Commerce to do a community time capsule here at the City Hall campus. And we do have members of the Chamber of Commerce available this evening if you have any particular questions. With that, I'll go to Christine. Good evening, Mayor Najarian, members of the City Council. I'm here to present this report uh, regarding the request by the Glendale Chamber of Commerce. 
The Chamber is requesting the City's support of this time capsule in honor of its 100th anniversary in providing service to the business community in the City of Glendale and in recognition of the ongoing partnership between the Chamber, the City, and the community. The contents of the community time capsule will be determined by the current board members of the Chamber, its centennial members, along with the Glendale City Council. Um, it would be buried on Tuesday, September 1st, and the tentative location at this time is Perkins Plaza. All costs for the time capsule will be incurred by the board, and any minimal cost for the burial will be incurred by the Public Works Department. The excavation of the time capsule in 2035 will provide historical perspective about Glendale and the role of the business community for future generations. And as Ms. Beers mentioned, I'm Rick Lemo, President of the Chamber, and Judy Kendall, along with other board members, are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Lemo, why don't you come forward and give us a little more detail about the project, as only you can. <laughs> I think you were right up until that last part. Uh, first, uh, before we get started, I want to uh, thank uh, Council Member, and actually at the time, Mayor Pro Tem Weaver, who uh, is responsible for swearing in, not swearing at, but swearing in this year's Board of Directors at our retreat uh, back in July. Also want to thank uh, city staff and uh, city management, as well as our city attorney's office, who uh, really did a great job in putting this together very, very quickly for us. Uh, we want to thank them for their patience, their understanding, their guidance, and especially their hard work uh, in a very, very efficient manner. Um, the chamber is celebrating uh, this whole year our 100th anniversary. Uh, actually, our 100th anniversary date is Tuesday, September 21st, uh, which is one week from today. The Chamber is certainly known as a business organization. However, this Chamber truly became a jewel to the City of Glendale for their extraordinary focus on how the business community can contribute positively to the quality of life for all residents in Glendale. Uh, when we talk about uh, a positive impact, uh, the fact of the matter is if we have uh, a good, strong business community, there is much positive impact that can help the quality of life, whether it be through sales tax revenue, whether it be through creating an environment in which people want to live. And so um, we're very anxious for you and ask for your support of this time capsule. Uh, with me tonight is our executive director, Judy Kendall. And she'll have some comments here in just a moment, as well as uh, two of our board members, Marco Swan and uh, Jose Sierra. Jose Sierra is one of our newest members of the board. Marco is really going to be famous 25 years from now because Marco is actually constructing the time capsule itself. So we give our thanks to Marco. Also, T.J. Denton is supplying the plaque for this. And as you might gather, Forest Lawn is supplying the vault. Um, it is a uh, two foot by two foot uh, cube, so I guess technically it's two foot by two foot by two foot, and it's designed first and foremost to commemorate uh, where we are 100 years after the chamber is formed. Uh, but 25 years from now, it will cause those who open it, uh, what we hope are the younger members of the community today, to open it 25 years from now and see where we were but it will also sort of draw a little line in the sand and set the stage for them to assess themselves over the last 25 years and see what progress they've made. And then last but not least, to challenge them as they go forward uh, with either a, replacing it with a 25-year, 50-year, or a 75-year capsule that will be opened at the 200th anniversary uh, to continue to strive to make the quality of life better through business here in Glendale. So that you can all mark your calendars, Friday, September 21st, 2005, uh, I'm sorry, 2035 is when this capsule will be opened. Um, and most members of City Council will probably be sitting in those same chairs 25 years from now. So we thank you very, very much for your time. We ask for your support, and uh, I'd like to uh, now turn uh, our, our speaker's podium over to our executive director, Judy Kendall, and we're available for any questions you might have. Yeah, you're causing a panic in the community, Rick, by, by <laughs> scaring people and letting them know we'll be here 25 years from now. So Either that or a sense of calm. 
Mayor Najeri and members of the council, city staff, Judy Kendall, executive vice president of the Glendale Chamber of Commerce. And as always, Rick has already said everything I plan to say tonight. So I will just say um, thank you to each of you for considering our request. Um, this is important to us. It is a, an opportunity for us to celebrate and commemorate 100 years of really good business in Glendale. Um, this is a great city. We have great businesses here. And, and we're excited about this. And, and uh, 25 years from now, it will be fun for the people who are here to take a look back and, and see what happened in the old days. So again, thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Well, let's talk about this. Mr. Quintero. I'm, I'm planning on being here, but not here. <laughs> <laughs> not in this chair. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I think... Uh, not only 25 years from now, but just going through uh, everything that needs to be done, what's going to be included, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a great idea. I'm looking forward to the ceremony and looking forward to wheeling Mr. Weaver over 25 years from now. And uh, I, I, I thought <laughs> and Mr. Weaver him. was going to be in the time capsule. <laughs> and having him. My uh, ashes could be. <laughs> having him participate in the ceremony. Good idea. Ms. Friedman. Do you have any idea yet what or who is going to be in the capsule? Are you going to put an again. iPad in there? <laughs> um, I can guarantee you there's no who is going to be in there. Um, as far as what, there's uh, different things from business in the area that would relate to the type of quality of life here in Glendale. For example, the Galleria and the Americana brand will provide us with a directory of the stores that are there and some of the special events that they're, they've done in the last, like, 90 days. We're, uh, the Alex Theater will be giving us, uh, has given us a, a, a little pin that represents the, uh, the, the finial that goes up. Uh, above the theater with the uh, Alex written on it. Uh, we're asking each of the council members to uh, put something that is small enough to fit within two foot by two foot. Um, and uh, that something that you think would be important that would send a message or set a timeline for folks 25 years from now. There will also be a Glendale news press um, from uh, actually the date that we're planning it, September 21st, uh, 2010. Um, so those type of commemorative things and other things that our board members will submit. We've also asked city management and staff to come up with some ideas that they'd like, and uh, they'll all go in uh, next week. We're going to schedule it so it's a time that you can all be out there in between the, the two meetings. Mr. Draymond. Well, Mr. Mayor, I was mentioning this to you earlier today, and it's, it's kind of humorous in a way. So I will share it with you. Well, it's 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 wonderful, actually. It's but uh, the possibilities are humorous. Um, we were wondering what would happen if, when you were out there digging a hole in which to put the time capsule, the shovel hit something solid and metal, and it went clink, and you looked and found there was another time capsule already there. I received an email from a longtime city uh, employee. Uh, Larry Morehouse, who's since retired, and he wanted me to relay the following. He said, I noticed uh, um, that uh, on our agenda for approval, there's a time capsule. You may not be aware that a time capsule does already exist somewhere on the plaza. <laughs> right after the Perkins building was finished and dedicated, we built a capsule at the power plant and put everything in it, purged it with argon gas, sealed it, and personally delivered it to one of GWP's assistants and the contractor and left it with them. They buried it, uh, and that night our assistant, Mike Cronian, I guess, died, and he was the only one other than the contractor who knew where it was put. It is 10 inches by 20 inches cylinder made out of stainless steel, with a date tag to be opened in 50 years. We built it to last several thousand years, and I may be the only person who knows what's in it. It would be very interesting to have a contest, and then it goes on uh, to mention certain uh, ideas about a contest that I think would give the city attorney fits, 
because it relates to people with prospecting gear all over uh, Perkins Plaza. Uh, this is a bit of history that hardly anyone knows. Have a good day, Larry Morehouse, a very dedicated retired employee. So thank you, Mr. Morehouse, as, as always, for tuning in. And, and uh, But I was sharing this with the mayor this morning, and, and we thought it was funny that if you were digging and the shovel went clink and so... Well, that would certainly get us even more press. Yeah, which, so I'm kind of hoping we do run into that. Though what I will tell you is we're going to be having uh, a plaque on the outside so that at least for the next 25 years, as long as someone doesn't cover it over by accident, uh, everyone in the city government will know what's there. Um, and hopefully we'll run into the other time capsule, and that would be a great press event. I would just suggest that when we, if we do run into the time capsule, Covered back up and hold it so we can get the press here first and then go through it again. <laughs> anyway, it's a terrific idea, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I certainly support it. It's, it's, it is great to create the, the, well, to memorialize what will be history in the future, and uh, so I think that's terrific. Mr. Weaver. Did you say the only person who died after he got this? That's what the, the email says. Are you about to make an announcement, Mr. Weaver? No, no, no it sounded like the curse of the pharaohs. You know, he <laughs> touched it and he's gone. Uh, well, the two-by-two two won't fit me. Uh, so I won't be there. My next resting place is Forest Lawn. And I'll be 96. So most likely you four will be here because you're all younger than I am. Telling you, I'm wheeling you over there on that day, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Weaver. If, if I come, I'll probably be in a wheelchair coming in that time. I, I hope to make it. Uh, it'll be great. The only concern I have, and it's just my own concern, uh, we are setting a precedence. Uh, we put a uh, chamber in. There could be another group that comes along and want to do another time capsule for the city. Uh, but I guess a future city council will worry about that, not this one. So let's do it. It'll be interesting to see what we put into it. We ought to get very creative on what we put in there. I put in a cell phone or something, and in 25 years, people will ask, what's a cell phone? Pull it out. Technology will have advanced so far. Now, yeah, uh, it's fine with me. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. I think it's a great idea, uh, Mr. Lemo and uh, Ms. Kendall and everyone else on the board. And uh, we were speaking about this earlier today, and, you know, you indicated that each one on council may have a little space on this, this capsule. And I, I said, well, maybe I'll put a picture of my best friends, the city council, in there. Uh, and then I thought again, and... <laughs> But, but what I'd like to say is if anyone in the audience can think of something a little more creative uh, and that, that would be a better, uh, a better token to place in the time capsule than my idea of the city council. You know, we've got a, a smaller version of our large photo. Uh, shoot me an email, and if it, you know, makes the grade, we'll replace, we'll bump the city council. Uh, but... Uh, We'll see what sort of ideas come forward. This is when's the deadline? When does the ship leave? Twenty first is the twenty first. Next week. We, we we need to have everything in by the twentieth. And the the Marco Swan who is designing the capsule said that when we get a picture, any picture for that matter, black and white, will uh, actually uh, live better than a color photo. Okay, I don't. I don't know the I reason why. But what does that mean? Well, I guess color degrades quicker. I, I don't know. I'm kidding. Laminated. Okay. Well, anyway, shoot, shoot, shoot me an email or shoot council your council members an email, and if there's something really cute and unique, uh, maybe we'll include that uh, in it. So, I think it's a great idea. You seem to have a resounding support, and we'll uh, put the bricks back where they belong, and it'll be look uh, untouched and a nice plaque there. And so, uh, the 21st between our meetings. Uh, between the afternoon and evening meeting? Yes, sir. And thank you very much. Forward Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank I'll you. Move. I'll move 8A. Second. Roll call, please. Council oh. members. Judy. Okay, Judy Spock. Thank you. Council Sorry. members. Friedman? I'm uh, Draymond. Yes. Friedman? Yes. Montero? Yes. Weaver? Aye. 
Aaron Najarian. Yes. Next item, please. 8B is a Director of Human Resources regarding resolution of the City of Glendale, uh, providing for the establishment of classification tiles and compensation oh, no. for employees of the City of Glendale. At B1 is a resolution for establishment of classification tiles and compensation for GCA confidential classifications. And at B2 is a resolution of establishment of classification tiles and compensation for GMA and GMA exempt classifications. Mr. Uh, if there's no questions, I'm going to go to Mr. Weaver. If nobody has any questions on it, we know about this already. I'll move Mr. Weaver. 8, uh, B, 1, and 2. Second. There's no discussion. I have no cards. Roll call, please. Council members, Freeman? Yes. Freeman? Yes. Ontario? Yes. Weaver? Aye. Aaron Adjourn? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. Thank you. Next item, please. At HC is Director of Public Works regarding pavement management program and the results of the most recent citywide pavement condition survey completed by Omnis Incorporated at C1 is a motion to note and file the report. Mr. Zern, this can't be right. Oh. This yes. can't be right. Humbly, we submit that for your uh, uh, humbly. Is... humbly. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, as I have said to you on, on occasions in the past, primarily when we've analyze the budget, what I've said to anybody who will listen to me, what I believe is the fundamental core mission of the Public Works Department, the upkeep and maintenance of the infrastructure and especially the road infrastructure of the city. And uh, it, it gives me nothing but great, great pride and pleasure to say I think we've done a very good job. And I'm not just talking about myself and the current staff, but, but my predecessors, uh, the City Council here today and your predecessors have all been very, very supportive uh, of our efforts to keep up the, uh, the street infrastructure system through the CIP program. And for that, I am eternally grateful to you. I, I, you have been nothing but tremendous in, in your support. Um, uh, many of my counterparts in other cities don't have that luxury, so I feel very uh, fortunate to, to have that. Over the last probably two budget sessions, there's been a little bit more focus on the roads, primarily because of the economic situation that we're in, uh, the fact that we're stretching every dollar that we have and prioritizing different projects. Uh, in many, many cities, the street budget is, is being slashed and cut tremendously. Um, the primary funding source for what we do is, is the uh, highway users tax account or the gas tax monies. Uh, and while it is intact today, it continues to be under fire from the California legislature as it, as it, it looks like uh, ripe fruit for the picking uh, to, to redirect to other, to other areas. We've seen some different shell movements with Proposition 42 monies. Um, we've had promises made that haven't come through. Uh, all of that, uh, very alarming. And so that, that's provided a little bit more impetus for us to focus on where we're going with our street system and, and, and where we're at now. Also, there's been some comments of late, some misinformation, as I like to say, about the condition of our street. And, and you all have, to a person, uh, have, have been, come back and, and, and indicated that, that many of those just aren't, aren't true. So we thought it would be a good time for us to take the opportunity to bring to you what is our technical overview, uh, our condition assessment program for our, for our uh, city street system, our pavement management system. We just recently finished what is our uh, five-year update. And every five years we do a major update of the, uh, the road system condition. In between that, we do our, our own uh, updates uh, based on, on the amount of money that we spend and the projects that we complete. But on the heels of this and the results of that, I thought it would be a great opportunity for us to bring that to you. So again, um, let me go to our city engineer, Rubik Golanian, because it is, he, it is him and his staff who do yeoman's work in, in keeping this. And I have to tell you, I am very, very fortunate and grateful to have that kind of an engineering staff. I have been on this man's back for the last seven and a half years to push projects out, and I've been relentless. But he's and nodding he, yes. He has done, yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> he'd be nice, I'm sure he'd like to say something about that, but he has been nothing short of amazing, he and his staff, in responding to that. And every year, despite the situations that we're in, the tighter budgets, uh, the, the Engineering Division of Public Works has continued to push more and more projects out. 
each year and to keep our, our road system in what I think is an enviable position with other cities, certainly those around us. And you're going to see some data that will that'll bear that out. Uh, but again, it is such a tremendous asset to us and to let it go, uh, and as many of you know, and, and Rubik will, will reiterate, it doesn't take much for us to slip and it begins to go and it is very, very difficult for us to get back to, to the position that we're in. So it's important that we, we're vigilant in our efforts. So with, with that said, let me have Rubik, Mr. Galani, and our city engineer come up and go through a very brief PowerPoint presentation, just a couple slides, and then open it up to any questions you might have. Okay, Mr. Galanian. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. As Mr. Zern noted, this is going to be a short presentation on a recent update to our payment management system that was completed recently, earlier this year, by a private consultant. Uh, payment management system uh, sometimes is referred to as payment management program, but they are the one and the same. Uh, so what's the payment management system? Essentially, it's a systematic process that provides, analyzes, and summarizes payment information for use in selecting and implementing cost-effective payment construction, rehabilitation, and maintenance programs. As a matter of fact, uh, payment management systems are a requirement for federal aid programs such as FHWA funding, as well as our Prop C funds that we receive from the state for street repair maintenance and bikeway projects. Please. Payment management is a three-phase um, process. In phase one, every street surface uh, condition is assessed visually and individually and assigned a payment condition and index from zero to 100. Zero needing a complete replacement and 100 being a near perfect condition. And then a current inventory is tabulated of our, of our uh, streets and roadways. Currently, we have over 366 miles of roadways, uh, which include uh, alleys. In phase two, uh, we use a computerized project listing of all the pavements needing maintenance, rehabilitation, or replacement, and, and these are uh, sorted, the data, alphabetically by pavement condition index and by maintenance districts. In phase three, a program is used to analyze the data, the data we just recently collected, and evaluate alternative uh, strategies to maximize the useful life of the payment. This chart uh, represents the payment condition index of several cities, including our neighboring cities, and the statewide average that have been assessed in the last few years. Not shown here is city of Long Beach that uh, last time in 1998 completed their assessment and their PCI was 54. It's important to, to note that city of Brentwood uh, with a PCI of 85 is the 12th fastest growing city in the state, and they have many newly constructed streets. The city of Livermore, as you all know, is in the Silicon Valley uh, with a population of only 77,000. The city of Chula Vista, uh, with a better, higher PCI, we have been informed that uh, in 2004, 2003 to 2004, annexed some areas north of the city that contain new subdivisions and developments. And then it brings us to the city of Glendale with a PCI of 74.6. The last update, as Mr. Zer noted, was done in 2005, and the overall PCI was 73. And we believe this is a tremendous achievement to move from 73 to 74.6 in, in five years. Next, please. And the state average then? 68. 68. So 68. We're this was done by uh, um, Nichols Consulting, but the word on the street from the contractors and engineers is that the actual real value, PCI value, is around 52. So we're way above the state average. We are way above the state average. Oh, Correct. Excuse me. Sir Draymond. Um, can we go back to that previous slide? Thank you. And, and um, my thanks to Councilmember Friedman for uh, pointing out the state average before we blast it off of this page because I also want to ask <coughs> you to uh, point out to our neighboring cities of Burbank and Pasadena as well. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Raymond, 
city of Pasadena, with a population of 139,000, uh, completed their assessment in 2007, and their payment condition index is 65. The city of Burbank completed their assessment in 2005. They have a, at the time, they had a population of 103,000, and their PCI was 64. We've heard from the staff is more like 62. It has actually deteriorated. So, so the myth that our neighboring cities are, well, let's put it this way, that the city of Glendale is somehow lagging behind our neighboring cities that somehow have latched on to some wrinkle in the infrastructure universe that has caused them to be light years ahead of what we're doing doesn't, doesn't seem to be borne out in, in this survey. Why is that, do you think? Is, is, myth the, is myth the word you want to use? Because I think a myth is something that's accepted by a significant number of right. How about a story spun? I think that might there be well, closer it, to... Councils, we've sat here, we have put more dollars into street improvements than the other cities who have chosen not to. That's why we have good streets. It's all a choice of the councils that I've sat on here to, to make that happen. Mr. Mayor, it, th Mr. that was Zern. the misinformation I was referring to earlier. I had but a feeling, Mr. Zern. I also wanted to point out, Mr. Galani, and correct me if I'm wrong, you'll notice there is one city that is absent from this list uh, that is our neighboring city. They apparently do not release the information. Fascist. That's correct. And they're not as transparent, Mr. Zern? <laughs> and uh, for those, uh, oh, they fine. come up often, but as I think we all know, there's a, probably a good reason they don't release that information. But uh, we don't have a clue of where they're at. They must keep the information to get the no. funding, but it's not something that they're willing to share. Couldn't we make a public records request? We probably could. Mr. Drayman? Mr. Drayman, I think, has Well, I was just saying, isn't, isn't one of those who, doesn't one of those uh, experts in pavement uh, live in that city that isn't on the uh, list? I think. Okay. Who accuses the Glendale Public Works staff and the Glendale Council yeah. of neglecting the streets. He lives in that city. Uh, it's not on there. Yes. Oh. And this is empirical data. Correct. Right. What, what I wanted to ask Mr. Mr. Weaver. Mayor, uh, since with all due luck, that person who doesn't live here and others will probably stand up and say, we hired the consultant. They gave us what we wanted. Now, do all the consultants have to go by some standards, state standards? So it's not a question we get what we want because different standards are applied? Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Weaver, we go through a qualification-based consultant selection only, and we do not provide any direction to the selected consultant on how to perform this payment assessment. The, the, they are the experts, and they perform these sort of assessments throughout the state. Okay, so that takes away the argument that our consultant gave us higher numbers. Mr. Drayman. Well, and, and Mr. Weaver, you don't even need to go that far to sort of, sort of blow a hole through that, that uh, concept because it assumes that, what, only the city of Glendale would be hiring a consultant that would be favorable to sure. them and every other city, what, hired the one consultant that wasn't favorable. But we will hear it. We will hear it. So. Well, I think this is great news. Are you, are you done? If I may, I have two more slides. Okay, let's... Got more three more slides. Okay. Thank you. So this next chart uh, presents the overall PCI ratings for all the streets in the city. Uh, the standard classification is for PCIs between 75 to 85 as very good and 86 to 100 as excellent. If you add up the, the last or the far most three columns, it's nearly 70% of all of our streets that are classified as very good to excellent. This is within Glendale? All within Glendale. So this Glendale. is solely Glendale uh, streets that are, are surveyed and represented here. Next slide, please. Mr. Draymond? And when we use the terms excellent or what was the other term? Very good. Very good or excellent. That's not just them wandering out there and saying, you know, I think this street is excellent. <laughs> it's it's a, a label given to a, a specific quantifiable portion of data, correct? Mr. Mayor, Councilman Draymond, these, uh, these consultants follow AASHTO guidelines for preparing Ashto. and AASHTO and classifying the streets. Uh, AASHTO. Yeah. AASHTO is Sorry, American... 
Echo Society. Uh, Society of Highway trans- and Transportation. Traffic. Something very prestigious. For guests. Okay. So this chart uh, is a similar uh, condition distribution, but the classifications are based on arterial collector and residential streets. We have 54 miles of arterial streets with overall rating of 80.6, 74 miles of collector streets with 67.4 PCI, and our residential streets fare a little less favorable, uh, and the reason for that is uh, the last few years we had been concentrating and focusing on rehabilitating our arterial and collector streets, but in the last two years or so we have moved toward uh, working on residential streets, as you might have noticed with all the slurry seal going on uh, within different districts. Um, and this also um, totals to a 300, 340 miles of street that are classified uh, within very good or excellent condition. And the last slide is a uh, graph that was developed by the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, adopted by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, Essentially this shows how it's an analysis to determine at what point simple maintenance becomes major rehabilitation. And in the chart it suggested that after 75 percent of the useful life uh, we can do renovation for about a dollar a square foot, but if we wait three more years or 12% longer, the cost substantially increases to four to five dollars a square foot. As you can see by doing preventive maintenance on a pavement earlier in the pavement life, a substantial amount of money can be saved and perhaps overall a pavement condition be maintained or even improved. This asset represents a replacement value of over $385 million for the city of Glendale. With that, uh, Mr. Weaver. Yeah, and that went to the point that we've talked about for a long time uh, in assessing the pavement. If you catch it before the cracks deteriorate till it starts destroying the substructure, um, you can get longer life out of it. Cities like Los Angeles that get it, let it go so far that they have to do total replacement, and they don't have the money to do it. Uh, one thing uh, you didn't read, and I think it's worth reading because it's it's in your report, I think it's important. It said in 2005, the American Society of Civil Engineers endeavored to grade the infrastructure within the state of California by counties. Los Angeles County and the city of Los Angeles also use computerized pavement management systems to, raise, uh, to rate uh, pavement inventories. They rated pavement sections on a scale of very good to poor and grades of A through F were assigned with an A grade corresponding with very good, a total of 1.8 billion square feet of street and highway pavement was studied. An overall pavement condition grade of C plus was assigned to public streets and highways in Los Angeles County in 2005 by an executive review committee. Similarly, the state of California received a D plus and the nation's infrastructure as a whole received a D. Using the same grading scale, the streets within the city of Glendale would have received an overall grade of A in 2005, uh, A minus, and would be moving in the direction of an A in 2010. So everybody just stand up here in the future and say that our streets are bad and we better get with it. They don't know what they're talking about. That's, that's remarkable for this city, for, for all the citizens, for all of us. Mr. Zern. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, as long as this last slide is up, it's a comment I wanted to make because it, it has come up from members of the public a couple of times, and that is that they used the miles of street reconstructed as the barometer for, for what we are or aren't doing, and, the, and it's, a, it's a small number. So they were extrapolating that into being, we're not doing our job because we're not reconstructing streets. Uh, Again, Mr. Galani and I would argue the opposite. If we are reconstructing miles and miles of street, we are not doing our job. We have not done our job to maintain that street over the years to prevent it from going to that high dollar per square foot 
cost of reconstruction. We can take residential streets and, and literally with the right maintenance strategy and spending the, the, the money wisely, we can maintain those streets for 40, 50, 60 years. Um, so we don't want to be reconstructing streets. That's not what we want to do. We want to be slurry sealing and resurfacing streets as needed, but, but not reconstructing. So anybody that tells you that you're not doing your job because you're not reconstructing streets, I argue the opposite. If you have so much street of your system that needs to be reconstructed, you are in big, big trouble. Mr. Ms. Let me go to Ms. Friedman and... Uh... So just, um, you know, we, we occasionally do get questions from people about the roads or about their road, and, and this is a very encouraging report. And I know that we stream all of our meetings on the Internet, of course, but I'm wondering if this report we shouldn't maybe pull out and put somewhere on the Public Works page of the city's website so that if people, when people ask, we can direct them very easily to a link where they can see the slides. Excuse me, but I just wanted to add, I talked to Mr. Zern. I have copies of the last two pavement systems over the last 10 years. The only thing I asked them, in the old ones, that it was on a descending scale uh, from the high to the low. If you want to find your particular street, you'd have to go through the whole thing. I asked him if in the one that will be coming out, it could also be alphabetically, so you could go and find the rating on your street, which he said can be done, and I asked if it could be put on the Internet so everybody can look at it without having to get a hard copy. We will do that. That's your question. We will do that in both uh, sorts. Okay. Were you were you done, Ms. Friedman? I'm done. Okay. I've kept my uh, copy so that uh, I've got it here in my drawer so that I'll have all the answers for basically one and a half people. One person keeps hammering. The other one kind of devotes half time to, uh, to this oh. issue. But, uh, anyway, it's just nonsense, and all you have to do is drive the streets adjoining uh, Glendale to get a feel for what uh, reality is. I happen to be going, uh, taking the uh, 101 to Laurel Canyon and then heading south on Laurel Canyon onto Mulholland Drive, and I'm doing it uh, five times a week. Uh, every time I'm driving Laurel Canyon, I feel like having one of the uh, speakers next to me and... <laughs> And having them experience what I'm experiencing on that. And that is an arterial, I'm sure. I mean, that is a major arterial, and it is a complete and utter disaster as it winds through, uh, through the canyon there. Thank you. Mr. Draymond? Well, I feel I should say, I, I should add, we've been a little bit glib up here, uh, <laughs> and I'll plead guilty to that on this topic. And I don't mean to be glib, but it is an issue. Uh, the city infrastructure is an incredibly important issue. And uh, as we all know, funds are tight. And keeping up our road maintenance is uh, not only a struggle right now, but it's also an essential part of our residents' quality of life. Um, but it's nice to know that, that there is some um, objective empirical data that we can look at uh, and point to that shows that we're doing quite well uh, in comparison to the comparable cities. And this is not to say to the public that every road in our city is in perfect condition uh, or that we can stop paying attention. Um, but that's not what we do. We do pay very close attention. And I'm sure every one of my colleagues up here, I know I have over the years I've been here, uh, we get emails all the time from residents that are inquiring about their roads, their streets, the alleys that, that service their houses or businesses. And those uh, emails are referred to Mr. Zern and his uh, department. There is always an immediate response, always. It's never a, uh, another time or go look elsewhere. It's always an immediate response. And I want, I want you to know, Mr. Zern, I appreciate that, but um, I guess Lastly, I want to say this, you, you mentioned it, Mr. Zern, this continued effort to use as a barometer uh, the quality of life in Glendale based on street infrastructure as number of miles of road reconstructed is just, I won't say intentionally because I don't know, but absolutely misleading in and of itself. It's simply, uh, there's just no nexus 
Um, and so, anyway, I, uh, I just wanted to go on, on the record, Mr. Mayor. I, I want to thank you for the report, and uh, thank you, Mr. Kalani. It was a good report, and thank you for the information. Thank you. Uh, it is good news, uh, Mr. Galani and Mr. Zern. Um, but as Mr. Draymond said, we have to continue our efforts and uh, maybe bump that up to a, a 76 if we can in the next uh, year or two. And and I would. I mean, it's a sense of relief here. We are berated by one individual or one and a half, as as Mr. Uh, Mr. Quintero puts it, uh, who continually uh, deride the council, deride staff to the point of mocking us uh, as to the condition of our streets. Uh, and finally, we have data, uh, empirical data, objective data, which we all, uh, in our own way, tried to explain and try to refute their charges and allegations. But now we have really something to go on. I would like this to be kept on a thumb drive. So whenever uh, that's, I don't know where that speaker and a half are today, uh, but whenever they come up, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is, is plug this back in and really, uh, you know, I'm just going to present them with, with the facts and, uh, and remind them and, and accuse them of intentionally trying to skew the facts and jump to erroneous conclusions and to paint this council and this city and the staff in a very bad light for their own benefit and for their own, uh, for their own other motives. Uh, this has to be ready to go, Artie, at any time. And uh, maybe we can keep that as an icon on the computer uh, that you have so we can just pull it up. Uh, and I'll be pulling it up before those speakers come to speak. Uh, and then maybe I'll reopen this this item. Okay. I know the city attorney is going crazy. That's what I add on, the uh, Mr. Weaver. The street that that uh, one individual complains about. I drive on the same street, and as an engineer, I'll say that street is in pretty good shape. I don't know what the rating is, but the lower end of Glen Oaks will eventually be repaved. Um, one thing for the general public should know: there's. There's a system to the madness that you see on streets where you see some torn up and you wonder why aren't they repaving. Well, there's coordination between electrical and water and gas and all the other underground utilities. We've been going through a system of upgrading water lines throughout the city, some storm drain lines. They're all underneath. Rather than put one in, repave, tear it up, put the next one in, repave, it's all systematically planned out, so all the underground utilities are upgraded first within a certain reach. Once that is done, then any repairs to curb gutters and sidewalks are done. Then the paving is done, hopefully not to be torn up again for years to come. So if you want an example, go up and look at Duran Street. I don't know when it's going to be paved, but they've been upgrading the water system. It's bumpy, but I'd be willing to bet the reach between Brand and I don't know if it goes clear over to Glendale Avenue is going to be repaved in the next year or two. Is that, you know, Mr. Uh, if that's true? Mr. Mayor, um, Councilman Weaver, it'll pro it will be in our next five-year CIP program. Yeah, see, so you, you, you have to wait sequencing the whole way through, so you wonder why you're driving over a bumpy road. It's because something else is happening in that road that hasn't occurred yet then it has to get into the uh, cycle. And then we don't award contracts for just one street. We do it in a system block so you get the best contract for the price. Um, so there's a whole mess of things that go into it. But that will explain some of the issues. Okay. Thank you. This is a, a note and file. If there's a motion and a second. I'll move 8C1. Is there a second? Second. With no objection. I this item will be uh, approved unanimously. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to reopen uh, council and staff comments and go to Mr. Weaver for an item. Well, you asked the beginning mayor, did I have anything? And I said nothing I could think of until Ms. Friedman reminded me what I was supposed to say. Um, last Thursday or Friday, we 
Uh, we're out at Griffith Manor, the groundbreaking to uh, restore that park, make it like it used to be. It was bought in 1927, I believe, Marvelous. something like that, way back. Nothing's really been done to it since. Um, so in sitting there, it's a three-acre park, and then sitting there, I looked out there, and when I got up to speak, I says, you know, too bad we can't take a section of the park in the back and create a dog park. And then talking about it, oh, thank you for the thumbs up. Ms. Friedman liked it. She says, put it on the agenda, and I'll back you on it, or to put it on the agenda. Uh, city manager happened to call me about that time, and he liked it, and he says, you're going to put it on, has to be put on. I said, yeah. The architect was there. He liked it. He's working on a schematic. Told uh, George Chapshin about it. And if we put it on, approve it, um, we'll have Glendale's first dog park. So, so I will and, second. And that's a park where the architect says is highly underutilized. Hardly anybody goes there. It's right off Western. And with a dog park in there, you're going to have a lot of cars going in to use that park, which is exactly what we want them to do. So it, It's also one of the only parks. It's the only park I can think of that's completely surrounded by non-residential. It's all commercial. So it's one place, and it's, it's commercial that tends to be loud commercial. So it's probably the one park we have where I don't anticipate we get very many, if any, neighbor complaints. And it will give people a real reason to go there. So I will second, I think it's a second of the bringing it back to council yeah. for us to discuss. Well, you know, I want to make sure that the neighborhood that was interested in this park and all the different yeah. meetings that we had with them, that they're included. Absolutely. See what they have well, yeah. to uh, Some say. Some were there. They Some were the there. Idea. Okay, back yeah. Up, we just want to make sure we get. Lot, to one side is a parking lot, and the other side is a three-story back of a building with no windows. Okay, we'll, direct, we'll direct park staff to uh, place this on the agenda with appropriate report and to Schematic do, some sort do the uh, appropriate noticing and whatever additional uh, outreach must be done due to the right. uh, modification to the initial Thank you for design. letting me okay. get wired up yeah. again. Thank you, Ms. Friedman. Great. Okay, I'm going to close uh, staff and council comments and move on to the next item, Mr. Kazakian. Next item is a uh, uh, full portion of oral communication where discussion is limited to items not part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. Members of the council may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision, and the matter may be referred to staff uh, through this, uh, by the city manager for investigation and report. Thank you. John Perron. Followed by Jennifer Pinkerton. Thank you, Mayor Najarian, City Council members, City staff. My name is John Perrin, better known as JP in the business world over in Glendale, and probably better known as Tamar Pladian's husband. Um, someday I hope to change that into Mr. and Mr. Perrin so that everybody recognizes us as the team. Um, I'm here to talk today about the <clears throat> excuse me, New Horizons. Family Center, um, I've prepared a press release for immediate release, um, and it is because the stimulus monies are to be paid back. Uh, as broker associate at Cranbrook Realty Corporation, <clears throat> I wanted to clear the air regarding a news conference held in Glendale, California this week, where senatorial candidate Carly Fiorina used the New Horizons Family Center property as a backdrop for her complaints about the ridiculous waste of taxpayers' money. As the listing brokerage representing the sale of New Horizons Family Center's property on South Maryland Avenue in the city of Glendale, Cranbrook Realty Corporation has been instructed by Maria Rochart, executive director of the center, to have all of the taxpayer stimulus funds returned upon the sale of the property. With the current state of the economy, I've been approached by numerous nonprofit organizations to assess their viability and ability to continue to hold real estate. I've also been asked to assess the options available, if any, to many of these organizations to allow them to continue to provide their respective local communities with much needed services. In the case of New Horizons, the fact that this stimulus money will be paid back exemplifies the spirit of the organization 
and reflects favorably on the merit of the center and the original decision to support and fund this project. This will have a good ending, in my opinion, and those involved can hold their heads high. Cranbrook Realty Corporation is a recognized name in the Glendale community and has built a reputation on supporting grassroots programs at the local level. Uh, my statement is that when the economic factors result in a change of plans, doing the right thing is the best thing for the better good. This group did not hesitate when they informed me that they would do just that. Maria Rochard and New Horizons Family Center have kept the plans and permits for this redevelopment in place, and the best outcome would be for a similar organization coming in and fulfilling the promise of improving our community. After all, the center was established to assist deserving children, and the expansion project was commenced to enhance the existing programs. We feel privileged to help our city and neighbors in any way we can. Regardless, our marching orders are pay back the money, bottom line. A little bit of background, New Horizons Family Center in Glendale provides child care, counseling services, and domestic violence services for adults and youth in Los Angeles County and serves low-income and immigrant families participating in their Even Start family literacy program that focuses on the development of the children and their families. And I know that uh, Carly Fear and Arena is using the the yearly list of taxpayer wasted money that, that they make a lot of political hay out of that. I just want to point out though, if, if the funds are all paid back, it will not be a waste of money. And I hate to see the city of Glendale and community members be smirched. I was told last night there was some of the news channels carried this story and some people saw they used the vacant lot on South Maryland as the backdrop, and some people saw my sign saying the property was for sale, and I just wanted to put a different face on that story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jennifer Pinkerton, followed by Sharon Weissman. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, City Staff. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'll be very brief. I'm just here to provide an update on the neighborhood that has been impacted pretty severely by the Disney project construction. Um, thank you, Council Member Friedman, for your comments. Those allude to the fact that we do continue to suffer impacts from the construction. Trucks, vehicles, equipment continue to diverse our street. Um, equipment that is on the site is being moved early mornings on Sundays after 10 p.m. on some nights with the beeping and all these associated noise. There was jackhammering on Flower Street after 7 p.m. on Saturday, so impacts do continue. Um, my second point, with your assistance and that of Mr. Starbird, the CRA has been in touch with us to convene a meeting, a stakeholders meeting with Disney, us, and general contractor Whiting Turner. But the meeting notice was distributed just this past Friday for the meeting that was scheduled originally for tonight, and we just felt that was not adequate sufficient notice for our neighborhood as a whole, so we did ask that that meeting be postponed, and that is in the works now. Um, due to the array and severity of the impacts that we've um, experienced during phase one without resolution, and because phase two of the project is now gearing up, we asked the CRA to consider inviting the Transportation and Public Works Department to the stakeholders meeting. The CRA asked us why, and I explained why, because of the transportation impacts in particular, but it's unclear if that invitation was ever extended to those other departments. Now, we attended the Glendale Homeowners Association Coordinating Council meeting last night, and that council recommended that in addition to transportation and public works, that the city attorney's office and the planning department and the city manager's office also be invited to that stakeholders meeting. So I'm here to say that if you feel it would be appropriate for those additional departments to also participate in that stakeholders meeting, we hope you will convey that to the CRA. And we also hope that the council members will stop by when the meeting is held, which we believe will be the week of um, October 4th. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Weissman, followed by Margaret Hammond. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Nigerian, council members and staff, I'm Sharon Weissman from Far North Glendale, and I'm speaking as an individual.
Some local issues have been troubling me lately, and I want to add my thoughts to the public discourse. First, Senate candidate Carly Fiorina's castigation of the New Horizons project as a prime example of government waste should be laughable given her party's consistent support of massively more expensive government undertakings in Iraq and Afghanistan. While I share Marinagerian's dismay at the spending of scarce government funds without the intended public benefit, at least the funds for the New Horizons project were spent in this country, and, and new information shows they're coming back to the uh, government, and uh, whatever was spent in planning for this project put Americans to work. The main harm from this local project failure is the lost opportunity to help low-income families with daycare. The hundreds of billions spent on current wars have not made the nation any safer and have mostly benefited multinational corporations. We painfully note the growing harm of these projects every week with the sad obituaries of the American service personnel lives lost. Osama bin Laden remains at large. I suggest the problem is not voting with your hearts, but whether not following up with your heads to implement what your heart tells you is the right thing to do. In my opinion, the biggest failure is that the nation has not set appropriate priorities. We're spending way too much money on war and way too little on facilities to help local families. I think Ms. Farina's, uh, Fiorina's position illustrates her lack of insight of the big picture and renders her unqualified for the office she's trying to buy. Next, I was disappointed that the questions di directed to the Glendale Water and Power Managers who came to the Glendale Homeowners Coordinating Council meeting last night focused on the transfer of funds from utilities to the general fund and assumed that it's a bad practice. It seems to me those who wrote the provision into the city charter intended utilities to fund city operations. That is the debate I think needs to be happening. How do we, as rational, just society members, fund all those things we expect from government? A third issue is the growing number of homeless in the local region, particularly those congregating in Sunland Park. That's only a short walk from Glendale, even dragging two shopping carts full of scavenged recyclables. A few months ago, combined efforts of Los Angeles City Council District 2 Representative Paul Krorian, the Sunland Tahunga Neighborhood Council, and community activists cleared out the homeless encampments in the Tahunga Wash. Local activists in Venice, California, have hounded the RV dwellers out of their neighborhoods, where they had been dumping holding tanks directly into the streets where the raw sewage can run into the storm drains that lead to Santa Monica Bay. It may be a coincidence, but campers and motorhomes are showing up on Sundantanga streets. With Glendale Water and Power drilling water wells in the Crescenta Valley, I personally don't want urban campers emptying their holding tanks in the local watershed. Aquifers don't stop at the city boundaries. The continued jobless recovery, expiring unemployment benefits, and more foreclosures had a, has added to the problem. Where well, there have been a number of projects to build more affordable housing and help the addicted get clean and sober, we still see many along Foothill Boulevard who seem to be living on the streets. A reoccurring theme in the discussions with City of Los Angeles residents is that Glendale dumps homeless, mentally ill, addicted people into Sunland Tonga. I've gotten assurances from uh, Glendale PD that refute these dumping claims. Do we have any statistics that show we are doing our fair share to provide housing and services for those who need it? Again, I see this as an opportunity to set priorities. For example, Caltrans still owns many homes it bought many years ago to demolish for the 710 surface route extension. While some are rented, some have been vacant for decades. More recently, foreclosures and evictions have added to the regional stock of empty homes as well as the homeless. There's something fundamentally wrong with this situation that begs for regional leadership. I hope to hear constructive solutions from elected officials and candidates. Uh, thank you for your time. And since I have just a few seconds, um, I'd like to remind you, uh, Mayor Nigerian, we haven't heard back on um, a request earlier to have you uh, recognize Glendale as a mayor for peace. And um, secondly, to those uh, concerned with some uh, other speakers here who make concerns about our roads, there are uh, vacancies on the Sunland Tahunga Neighborhood Council that I would direct those people who live 
in uh, Tahanga might wish to apply, and then they could be part of the solution instead of just bringing the problem up. And uh, lastly, I think a dog park's a great idea, and I would love for there to be a friendly competition between the unincorporated um, area in Crescenta Valley who are currently planning a dog park in Crescenta Valley Park and the city of Glendale. I think we could have a, a rush to see who gets the dog park in first and, or maybe coordinated ending at the same time. Thank you. For Thank you, Ms. Weisman. Margaret Hammond, followed by Asatur Bagdasarian. Good evening, um, Mayor Jarian. Council members, staff, and audience. My name is Margaret Hammond, longtime <laughs> resident of Glendale. But contrary to uh, some public conversation or belief, I was not born and have never lived in the doctor's house. I just helped to uh, get it reconstructed. Um, you know, while we uh, in South Glendale are grateful for the increasing parks and libraries, um, etc., but we're still having problems. And quality of life is not just based on uh, perks, uh, quote unquote, such as parks, etc. Um, graffiti, vandalism, and robberies are real quality of life problems, day in and day out. We, there's no covering that up. Um, and you know, again, as I say, it's not just uh, those those particular perks, and it's not about and it's not about having your neighborhood just graffiti, vandalism, and robbery. It can also, um, your quality of living can be, um, shall I say, taken away from you through having um, building uh, of build construction done in your neighborhood that ends up um, encroaching on your quality of life with noise pollution, air pollution, and dirt pollution. And it causes loss of pride in your home and in your neighborhood. Um, you know, where, are, where is your quality of life when these things are happening uh, ongoing, night and day? It's not fair. It's not right. You know none of us would like it if it was in our neighborhood, and particularly when it affects the value of your homes. Uh, sure, they're modest houses. They're not big estates. But every homeowner in Glendale is entitled to a quality of life and uh, for these people suffering the problems to their homes, such as cracks and uh, in the walls and the foundations, and having to put up with the dirt and the noise, um, as I say, day and night. I don't think these people are lying. Why would they get up here and say that? I mean, they're, they're quality people. They're, they're good people. They're working people. They've lived here many years. They're not just coming in and saying, oh, hey, this is what's happening to my house, and therefore I want to have, have payment on it and so forth. No. They're coming forward because their homes that they have put money and time and effort into uh, improving has been uh, destroyed. They're going to have to go all through the same things over again. They're being offered, what, car washes, wash your house down? What has that got to do with cracks in your house, in your foundation, and so forth? It's not good at all, really. I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, none of us, again, as I say, though we don't live in that neighborhood, would want in our neighborhoods. And by the way, Mr. Zern, I want to thank you very much for Chevy Chase. I think you have made it a quality a street, an avenue, and a lot of the homes on that street. There are a lot of small apartment houses, and they have all done a lot of um, improvements on those particular apartments, and the street really is a, becoming a very nice street, very uh, good looking to drive up and down, and I think what you have done in improving that street has greatly added to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Asatur Bagdasarian, followed by Rubik Ovanesian. Hi, Mayor and Councillor, everybody. Uh, uh, this is uh, last time I was here, kind of it's dream for me, but uh, I have a problem, that's why I'm here. And uh, Mr. Mayor, he knows me, actually. I fixed his car. Sorry to say this one, but uh, you know, it's not. I don't want to take any advantage. Uh, of course, sorry. I hope. Uh, 
I was doing a modification at a mortgage company or a service company. <coughs> Sorry, they sold my house without telling me. I was doing some work. Uh, it's a long story. I lost my business property. That's why I was uh, trying to work from home, mobile service. Still, I am doing. But uh, uh, they destroyed my family. I need uh, your help to keep my house. I lived in Glendale over 30 years, and also I live in this house for 14 years, getting over 14 years. And uh, uh, I was shocked when they come knock the door and they say, from investor, uh, they come knock the door, they say, you will live here or you're gonna move. I said, what you mean? Why are you, what, what you are doing here? Who sent you? So they say, your, your house sold in auction. I was shocked and uh, I don't know how much you're gonna believe me. I got sick, I went hospital twice because I work really hard for this house. Uh, I bought my business property, I lost because of fraud. So I have to work after the house, uh, see if I can get them, get them back. Then uh, now I am my life, they destroy my life. I am struggling and my chest hurts also, my right left side. I don't know how much you believe me, but I cannot sleep, I cannot think. And uh, now I have some opportunity, I will start my business uh, from tomorrow, uh, so I can pay my mortgage. Uh, they promised me it would be $945, and I say it will be great. I was happy. Then they sold on January 5th, they sold my house. Now I continued to fight almost eight months, and uh, I filed all the paperwork. Every court, they said denied, denied. Nobody checked my paperwork, what, what I did, what I did wrong why they are denying. I need to see if somebody, they can help me. Uh, any lawyer, any attorney I go, they say $5,000, $10,000, and I cannot promise you do, because they, the investor, they bought your house. Investor, I understand, you need to invest, I like to invest, but right away I told them, uh, this is a fraud, you shouldn't continue, I continue, I went to bankruptcy, emergency, I did bankruptcy so they can stop. Uh, nobody stopped that process. So please, I ask everyone, every powerful person, uh, help me to keep this house and I want to uh, continue my life peacefully. I'm trying to work and bring my family back together. Everybody, they are upset. My family, my close family, they are upset. Other family, uh, they are upset. They say, everything is your fault. Uh, I, I told them, it's not my fault. I was doing modification with the bank directly. Who I can trust? I have to trust my own bank. I have to trust my family. Who, I, who else I have to trust? I have a customer. They give the key. They say, fix this car. I can put my name, that car, I can put my name, because they trust me. And I make Abe because of my la first, la first letter from my last name, first letter from my first name, and E, expert on my business. So I put Abe. I had Abe Precision, uh, before I had Abe Precision Clinic, I sold my business, then I come buy on Ocean View Boulevard. They did fraud. My family, they did, one of my family did fraud, so I have to work on it. So how, who I should trust? I had a hard time, the place I came, they forced me, they said, you have to go this way. I said, no, my way is this way, it's a square. I want to go my home, they said, no, you have to go this way. So now I come here, I want to, I'm an honest person, I never cheat anyone, I never did anything wrong, I try my, I'm trying to do my life, you know, follow every single law, everything, you Thank know, you, Mr. Baggis, as much sorry. I can do. I need your help. Okay. We'll they be, give me eviction. We you know, can answer you at the end of the 
Where should I live? The the I don't have anything place, place, any place to live. Thank you. Mr. Ovenishan, if you'll hold on, I think there's a related speaker. Thank you for your opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Brookhart, the Honorable Brookhart, J.D., by a power of attorney. You were here a couple of weeks ago. I thought you said your name was C.R. Legal it Senior. It is. I'm appearing by power of attorney. For, for the Honorable Brookhart, J.D.? Yes. So I want to give honor to the mayor and to the distinguished city council. Um, if, when you gave me a chance to speak, you draw the connection. Um, Mr. Brokart, he had a similar problem that Bagdasian had, had, where sometimes the legal system fail you, or there's an individual in the legal system who usurps their authority and it's a difficult process getting civilized men and women of equal power to be a check and balance to someone who has usurped their power. Brokhart had a case similar. He's an advocate commissioner in Pasadena appointed by the Superior Court. He had a case number B as in black, C as in cat, 413887. I'm reading from the minute order. Where Judge Amy Ho told him she wasn't going to follow federal removal statute. She just point blank said she wasn't going to follow it. And it happens from time to time. Some state judges do not want to yield to a greater power, which is the federal government. And it happens for whatever their reasons. However, after a five months odyssey, she recanted herself on May 11, and she retransferred the case from her courtroom, and she admitted she didn't follow the law. Now, that's unusual for a judge, first of all, to once they usurp their power, to have that good sense and wisdom to reverse themselves. But it did take five months, and she did threaten to put him in jail, and she did order that he pay sanctions when she had no jurisdiction. Now, why is that important? And why is that serious? Because, Mayor, I think you're a lawyer, as I understand it. So you know the law. And if you don't have any jurisdiction and you start ordering people to jail and you start ordering people out of their homes, these are federal crimes. They're serious. To the individual that's involved, who's usurping their power, it's just business as usual. But it's not. We have drawn a line in the sand and said, when you don't have jurisdiction, that's the only time you step outside the protection of government and you become a criminal. When you have jurisdiction and then you abuse it, that's okay. It happens all the time. Everyone sometimes abuses their power and their discretion. That happens. We're human. But when you are a judge and you do that and you know that you're doing it, it's more serious. And so what the other gentleman was talking about is that the judge in his case, Judge Doyle, said that he's not going to follow the law and you can't make him. And he's refused to follow federal removal statute. And this is what he's talking about. And he feels that there should be some check and balance in a city and you have equal men of wisdom and knowledge and rule of law that can protect him because you're his protectors. This city, and not just one city council person is his protector, but as I understand it in Glendale, all of you are elected at large, so you're all responsible for protecting them. And there's one phone call to the chief of police who says, why don't you check out that house and see if there's really fraud going on, like he claims. Check out and see if they really violated federal removal. Or check and see if the judge really took a bribe. And some reason, this families being disintegrated. It just takes a call to find out. But what you will find out, because several attorneys did check it out, Mark Garriga said that he's prepared to defend him in case there's a criminal case. David Tillum is prepared to go to bankruptcy court and, pr and protect his rights in the bankruptcy court. Attorney Marks talked to the sheriff's department in order to see if they would not, in essence, kidnap him. Because if you don't have any jurisdiction, this is not a game. 
It's serious. If you don't have authority to act and you bring guns and drag, drag someone out of their home, that's an offense. And it's a civilized society. And we shouldn't get to that point over money. Life should never have played second fiddle to capital, investment, and monopolization. It shouldn't, but it happens. But it's never wrong to do the right thing after someone has done the wrong thing. And it's never wrong to have the courage to say no. The buck stop here. We're not going to do this thing. For what? Now, I'm out of time, but I think you got the gist of what I'm talking about. And Thank you. You operate on your own conscience. Thank you. Thank you. Rubik Obanessian. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, honorable members of the council and staff. My name is Ruby Govanessian. I'm a resident, property owner, business owner, city of Glendale. And um, before I start on my topic of the item I'm going to read, I want to take a moment to congratulate Ms. Beers on her appointment as assistant city manager. Welcome. It's a fresh addition to an excellent addition to the excellent staff we have in the city of Glendale. Tonight, I want to speak on a petition to the city of Glendale to construct side sidewalks within Granby Avenue. Um, Granby Avenue is a major street heavily traveled by automobiles, pedestrian joggers, as well as bicyclists, with recently designated roadway markings for bicycle routes. Granby Avenue, particularly above Bel Air Drive, is extremely narrow. It provides for a curb-to-curb -curb roadway width of approximately 28 feet. Although unmarked, this 28 feet roadway width provides for an 8 foot wide parking lane on the east side of the street, a 10 foot wide southbound lane, and a 10 foot wide northbound lane. These lanes widths are substandard. A standard lane width for a traffic lane is 12 feet. Grandview Avenue serves as the primary entrance to Brand Park, which is heavily utilized by the general public for picnics, t ball games, soccer, and other recreational sporting activities. Brand Park also houses a library and facilities for public meetings. Grandview Avenue lacks continuous sidewalks between its intersecting east and west streets. The pedestrians are therefore forced to step out of the parkway and walk out the roadway to share the roadway with vehicles and bicycles. Pedestrians frequently cross Grandview Avenue mid-block when the sidewalks are interrupted on one side of the street to utilize the sidewalk on the other side of the street. Sidewalks are pre present on an irregular and incomprehensible pattern. Under the current conditions, due to lack of adequate sidewalks, the safety of the pedestrians and joggers on Granby Avenue is jeopardized, and there have been many near misses, miss accidents, compromising the life of the pedestrians and joggers. We're talking total of 69 property owners, and 35 already have sidewalks of various sorts. Um, we're talking about 34 properties that, if they have sidewalks, would make it very easy and continuous for public to use. This is a destination-oriented Brand Park area, and a lot of people use it. Uh, today, actually, repairs are being done on the existing sidewalks on repairs. I want to commend the staff, uh, Mr. Zern, uh, Mr. Gulanian, Mr. Bagdanian, doing an excellent job. Uh, throughout the city, I've had many dealings with their department. Uh, further to complicate the matter, some homeowners take it upon themselves on each side of the roadway. Uh, they plant shrubs, bushes, hedges, trees, uh, vegetation of some sort. I've constructed some other blockages, as you would call it, even if someone wants to continue, is their block. So uh, maybe neighborhood services needs to pay attention uh, within a time to address some of those issues. As we speak, 51% of the properties uh, have uh, a sidewalk. We're talking about 49%. Uh, we're, a couple of homeowners and I, neighbors on the street, we've gotten together, put this petition together. We're currently circulating as we speak. And one of my employees that is just walking around and as a volunteer, he used to live in the neighborhood himself, he says that the support has been tremendous, not only by the property owners that don't have the sidewalk, they would like to have it, 
Furthermore, there's a lot of people that jog, uh, ride their bicycles, and even elderly, young, and uh, uh, ladies that you know take their kids on their strollers uh, around in the park. So I would ask, I urge the council to uh, maybe uh, look into the matter and ask Mr. Zern and to, to further investigate it and see if there's an opportunity. I know it's a budgetary issue, but, uh, you know, God forbid something happens, we're all going to look back and, you know, kind of say we should have taken uh, action when we had the opportunity. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Uh, the last card I have is Ara Kirkjian. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. First of all, I haven't been here for quite a while. Congratulations for a new chamber. Uh, when I decided to come before you tonight, I didn't get a chance to write anything uh, like most of uh, previous speakers. But what brings me here in a um, in nutshell, the name itself doesn't smell good, it's called trash. Um, several, maybe a couple months ago, some noise woke me up uh, when the weather was warm and we were sleeping with our windows open. About 3 a.m. I woke up, looked out the window, someone was going through my trash. I said, when I bump into one of the council members, uh, I'll remind them that maybe we should detract these people from going through people's personal property, trash, it might be um, identity theft issues over there and so forth. And lo and behold, I forgot about it. And until um, today, um, actually, let me give you a little background. Uh, when you go to pull a building permit, I guess the building department requiring for builders to post deposit to recycle their trash. And on construction sites, they're recycled ready trash. And I guess it had become magnet to people who go and collect these recyclables, and as a matter of fact, non-recyclables, and take it with them. And I, I learned it the hard way today. Uh, I think there should be something for, to attract these people from going into people's homes, going through their trash, through construction sites, and uh, businesses and apartments or and so forth for that matter. And uh, if they go, if they're hovering around the residential areas, it could be monitoring people's behaviors, what time they're home, what time they're not leaving, uh, leaving their pattern of life. And when they're at businesses, they have no business to be there. And if anything, they create congestions. Maybe uh, it's something the city council should uh, look into it and uh, keep these people away from people's properties. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't have any other cards. Um, or communications is closed. I want to just start off by addressing uh, two of the speakers, Mr. Bagdasarian and Mr. Legal. Um, I. I truly uh, understand your frustration and the extreme difficulties that you uh, appear to be going through in between uh, a foreclosure and an eviction. Uh, and obviously you're turning to the city council for help and assistance on that. But uh, from what I've seen and, and some of the documents uh, that you left two weeks ago, I did go through. Uh, line by line and the documents you have today, there is, uh, this is just not the city council's jurisdiction. There is nothing we can do. This is a, uh, a uh, superior court matter uh, which was initiated, uh, a, a foreclosure which occurred, a resale of the house. Uh, the current owners, uh, purported owners, uh, have sought an eviction. Uh, there was a bankruptcy filing. Uh, a, a federal bankruptcy court case uh, initiated uh, a request for a stay, and the issue now is should there be a should the federal stay extend to the state court uh, eviction unlawful detainer process? There is nothing we can do. We can't pass a law. We can't pass an ordinance or a resolution that in any way uh, interfere or get involved in the state court or the federal. Uh, bankruptcy court a process. Um, even if we were to direct our police of, uh, chief of police to look into uh, real estate fraud, there was an article in the paper indicating a lot of that going on lately. Uh, that's something that would take uh, weeks and weeks, if not months, to investigate, 
to be referred to the district attorney uh, for prosecution, criminal case filed. That does not appear to be something that's going to uh, solve your immediate uh, concerns. Is that pretty much the situation, Mr. Garcia? I mean, there's nothing we can do as a council to to interfere with either the state court or the bankruptcy court's uh, actions at this point. That, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. And, and if you had asked, that would have been the answer I would have given. Uh, just to say there are remedies they can seek in both bankruptcy court and state court, including appeals that they can follow if they, if they feel that the decisions made by the trial courts were in error. And that is outside the council's jurisdiction. So it's not that we don't we don't feel for you. It's not that we don't. And I know you're you're a good guy, Mr. Bagdasarian. Um, it, there's just nothing we can do. We we can't pass a law. We can't agendize an item that would uh, that would give you the relief that you're looking for. Uh, and those are just my topics uh, comments on that topic, Mr. Quintero. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Mr. Najari. Um, feel very sorry for Mr. Bagdasarian because it's obvious that something went wrong, but this is the wrong venue, unfortunately. Hopefully the police, the Attorney General's office, the Los Angeles District Attorney, someone will look at your case, investigate, and bring you some relief. Uh, then on the issue of the political candidates campaign uh, there on top of the Toyota dealership, um, New Horizons, from what I read in the newspaper, I believe uh, stimulus money, I don't know exactly how much we have, 140000 131000 and the other amount. Um, they just received 131000 um, I think there was CDBG. Right. So basically, uh, whatever monies the city fronted for this uh, child care center, and it is seen, I assume it's not going to get built, the sale of that property will certainly cover all of the monies that were advanced by the, by the city uh, to forward this project. And most of the money was spent in planning, architectural renderings, etc. But now I'd like to ask the candidate, why doesn't she do something about Halliburton? Why doesn't she do something about the tens of, never mind the hundreds of billions of dollars that were spent in Iraq, but the tens of billions of dollars directly tied to fraud from American corporations and, and what I assume were Iraqi corporations and Korean companies and everybody else that participated in that uh, situation there in Iraq and the so-called rebuilding of, her, of Iraq. I really think she'd be better off crawling up that uh, a tree to see what she can do to get some of that uh, money back. But, well, cheap shots are what politics are, are all about, and that's certainly a cheap, cheap shot. Um, I agree with the uh, uh, speaker on uh, Grandview. I hope we can explore to see what options uh, might be possible. I don't know what uh, what our right-of-ways are, etc., but um, it is one of the main uh, roads leading to uh, Brand Park. That's all. Mr. Draymond? Well, I'll turn to Mr. Zern, because uh, we've discussed this issue about Grandview sidewalks at least twice, and uh, I know that they have uh, already preliminarily looked at this, so. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, council member Draymond, yes. Mr. Ovanessian brought this up some time back, and then, Mr. Draymond, you asked uh, that the Public Works Department look at it, and I've had two updates that I provided you, at which time I told you a couple of things that we were running into. One is uh, the, the, the east and west side of the streets are not, not similar. The, the, the east, the west side of the street has different, um, different grades and, and a lot more problems. So we were looking... We have Grandview Cemetery where it's not compatible to build sidewalks. We were looking at options of possibly serpentining the sidewalk, but we finally came up with a conceptual design that will allow us to put a continuous sidewalk from the top of Grandview down to uh, meet the area where the sidewalks currently exist just below south of, of the cemetery. I'm just putting the finishing touches on a brief report to Mr. Starbird to distribute to you. Um, we've run the numbers. It looks really good. And because of some favorable bids we've received this year, I think that the climate is right to do this. The only thing I want to do is to notify all the residents who will be impacted. Um, 
Mr. Ovanessian talked about his survey uh, on petition, uh, but sometimes when you when you let people know exactly what's going to transpire and how their yard is in, is going to be impacted, uh, it may change their thought process. But we want to get their input early. I think most people will be um, supportive. We, I just want to do that that outreach effort before we we bring it back to council to formalize a set of plans and specifications. But as I said, I hope to have something to Mr. Starbird this week to distribute to you, but that, that's it. That's what my report will say. The bottom line is I think we have a real workable solution. It meets the intent of ADA. It gives you a continuous straight path down, a uh, uh, sidewalk path down, a uh, grand view. We have many uh, crosswalks to get from the west side to the east side, with, and we will have all the intersection ramps improved as well to meet current standards. So I think, uh, I think we were able to come up with a real doable uh, project there. Thank you, Mr. Zern. Um, let me go to Ms. Friedman, then I'll go no, back. No. Um, just a few things. I have a question. I don't know for who. Um, I'm glad to hear that New Horizons, that they have a solution and that they plan to give this money back. Does that money go back to RCDBG or does it go back to the federal government? Actually, no. um, yes, we do. And we've looked into this, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Just a quick overview of the New Horizons situation and, and just can. Uh, concurring with everything that, that you have said. In the fiscal year 2008-2009 annual program for the CDBG Block uh, Grant Recovery Program, New Horizons Family Center had requested funding for pre-development costs towards the actual construction of a new 10,000 square foot uh, child uh, development center. And the $131,000 was appropriated to New Horizons at, at the time. Um, since uh, the project is, has been canceled and it's not going forward, as indicated, uh, they will be repaying the city, uh, and the city plans to recycle these funds uh, to another economic stimulus uh, eligible project that we may have. Uh, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development, HUD, basically, has indicated to us that the recycling of the funds is completely legitimate and they're okay with that. Good to know. So that money will stay in Glendale. Um, in terms of the neighbors impacted by Disney, I don't think that anybody thinks that you're making anything up. I know that nobody would sit through these meetings um, week after week um, uh, based on a fantasy, so there's something going wrong there. Um, you know, we're getting different information from different parties, but I think your suggestion of different departments attending that meeting is a very good one, and we'll absolutely make sure that the people that need to be there are there. And whatever we can do to foster communication between you and Disney, we will do. Um, there's a limit to what we can do, but we'll do what we can. Um, and in terms of Ms. Weisman's question about services for the homeless in Glendale, um, I think it's a good, it's a fair question. I know that we've been doing a lot in terms of Path Achieve, and they're building a new building that will help expand their program. And we seem to be very committed to building affordable housing, which doesn't always reach the people that are camping out below bridges, but it's a good step, first step and something that I know this council, long before I got here, has been very committed to. Um, but it's, you know, certainly the homeless situation is growing and it's, it's a real concern. And I think, oh, the trash stealing. You know, I've been getting a lot of emails about trash stealing, and I know that this is something that's been going on a lot in Glendale. And sometimes people, at first people were thinking that it was all about identity theft, and then there's been more and more evidence that the majority of it is for recyclables, which is some good news, I guess, unless you happen to be the construction site that loses all of your copper piping or all of your you know, equipment to theft. Um, I did ask the police department at one point about this, and it is a crime. Uh, and all I can say to the police department is I hope that this is something that we really keep an eye out to, that when people call to complain that we get out there as quickly as we can and try to arrest people. And if it's a crime, let's prosecute, because I've heard stories about trucks filled with recyclables just being left overnight in neighborhoods where people are rifling through recycle bins, and, and that just has to stop. Um, so I don't know who exactly I'm speaking to, but... Um, Take that as a call to call to arms, Mr. Zern. Mr. Mayor, 
Ms. Friedman, there is an anti-scavenging ordinance, is what we call it in the city. So once once your receptacle is put at the curb for collection, it becomes the property of the city of Glendale. So any rummaging or theft of it is actually theft of city property. That's technically what, what occurs. And we've always encouraged folks through the various newsletters we have in integrated ways to, to contact us if it's business hours, contact the police if it's, if it's during after business hours. But you are seeing an increase, and it's a result of the economy. Um, our, our recycling numbers are way, way up, and we see people going after valuable recyclables to, to try to make some extra money. So it is important for us to be more vigilant. We, we want to keep those recyclables in the system and be, we, uh, get the credit for those. But more importantly, the folks who are doing and going through the effort of, of separating their goods deserve to have those processed appropriately and not have people going through their refuse. And usually it is somewhere between midnight and, and 5 or 6 in the morning. So. Uh, and the C and D debris is something outside of the theft of valuable commodities on the site, whether that's copper and, and wiring and those things. I hadn't heard that, that the, the debris that people are setting aside or developers and contractors are setting aside to meet their requirements under the permit were being pilfered. That usually is not a real valuable commodity. It's valuable in the sense of not putting it in the landfill. It doesn't have a lot of... In fact, it, it has no redemption value. You have to actually pay to have it taken away. So, um, But we'll, we will double-check that and make sure we have our outreach that has the uh, contractors putting that stuff away and securing it so it's not available for for. Well, I haven't heard much from the contractors about the recyclables. I know that they've, I've heard of thefts of you know materials. But I know we have a lot of really frightened homeowners. I mean, I got a whole flurry of emails from people very concerned catching people in their garage, you know, going through their trash. And it's, you know, this is something we need to take seriously. Okay, Mr. Quintero. I forgot to mention the uh, neighbors. Well, thank God I drove by there last week. At least it looks nice. Finally, the landscaping in it. And so that's a big step forward because it was nothing but a dust bowl through the whole construction process. But I agree with their assessment. Hopefully we'll be able to to get some of the uh, city departments out to see what uh, we can do to just follow up on their on their issues. Mr. Draymond. On that, um, I, I assume you all probably got the same email from one of the residents that was talking about, maybe that's what you were talking about, Councilman Friedman, about the uh, late night beeping and so on. And they went to investigate and found the gate open and some sort of high pitch noise coming out of uh, the site. But I'm also wondering, are, I mean, is anybody there actually calling the police when this is going on so that there's a record of it and so it can be investigated? Because just emailing a council member a day or two later doesn't really get at the heart of what is causing the problem. And, and we can't, these are, these are more or less rhetorical questions, but I'm sure that after the meeting... Uh, what I'm saying is uh, I, I'm trying to encourage the, the neighbors there that if there is an issue of that sort something that is, you know, immediate and is identifiable, um, you should call the police. Don't be afraid to do that and let them know. So there is a record. They can go out on site, find out what it is, identify it, and, and correct, you know, work to correct the problem. Uh, as much as all of us immediately forward your emails when, when we read them, it doesn't help you at, you know, 1130 at night, midnight, when you're trying to sleep. So thank you. Okay, Ms. Beers. Um, on that note, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, regarding the issues raised by uh, Ms. Pinkerton, um, Community Redevel Redevelopment and Housing is looking into the issues in the email that we received last night in terms of the, the high-pitched sound that was coming, as well as the construction issues that are happening in the evening and weekends. So that's on the one hand. And secondarily to that, Alan Castillo, uh, who works in Community Redevelopment and Housing, is working um, with, with uh, Ms. Pinkerton to come up with a date along with the uh, Disney team and the city team so that we are all going to be able to be at this meeting and, and have a community uh, neighborhood meeting to, to be able to answer any questions. And we believe that that meeting will occur hopefully sometime uh, in the beginning of October. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have any new business? Uh, adjourn. Second. We are adjourned.